Today I want to talk about Charles Goodwin's article, Professional Vision. This week I am going to go a little bit deeper into the first part of the article that we're reading by Goodwin, only because I feel like he uh, spent a good half of the article explaining things that were very heady and very difficult to understand before he actually got to the, the meat of his article, which was a discussion of Rodney King. So I want to make sure that his uh, philosophical ramblings don't sort of get in the way of us understanding where he's going when he talks about King at the end. Please do read the entire chapter, but also realize that if for some reason you're struggling with the first half, it does sort of change voice and change tone towards the end. And I'm going to focus mostly on the first half in this discussion. So Rodney King was a uh, motorist that, as you read about, uh, was brutally beaten by the police in 1991. What Goodwin is looking at is what on earth happened with these videos and these images such that some people saw completely opposite things as other people. Many people saw obvious police brutality rooted in racism and classism, and other people saw obvious lawful arrest whereby a suspect was resisting and needed to be dealt with the way that he was dealt with, and they saw no racism at all. And what Goodwin wants to figure out is what on earth is happening when the same image can bring such different responses in different people. What he's going to do before he gets there is discuss how any event that happens that we want to talk about as a culture or as a group of people typically falls into three main criteria when it comes to discussing it. It has to be coded, right? And coding simply has to do with, do we have a way to talk about the event? He also discusses how highlighting comes into play, and highlighting simply has to do with which parts of the event were the most important. And we can all think of that storyteller that we've been in a room with who's telling a story, and they're completely oblivious to the fact that they're telling the boring parts of the story and ignoring the important parts. Highlighting has to do with what what should you be focusing on? And then also articulation and word choices and the way that we make the story come to life and make the event come to life, the way that we point and move and read each other's movements and facial expressions as we talk about things. What Goodwin is doing is saying all three of these things effectively produce an event as we talk about it and as we discuss it, which is where meaning is actually made. Meaning isn't made in an event. Meaning is made in the process of discussing and thinking and processing. So this idea of an event, I keep using that word and it's a word that's used quite a bit in the chapter. An event requires three things in Goodwin's eyes. It requires a domain of scrutiny, which simply means that somebody's scrutinizing it. Some, somebody is paying attention to it. If nobody notices or sees something happen, or if nobody has any idea that it happened and there's no evidence of it, it never happened so far as we are concerned. It, it was not an event. It also needs a description a set of discursive practices being deployed. And all this means is we need to have a vocabulary for speaking about what happened. And then uh, the discussion usually takes place, or always rather, takes place within a specific activity. And all that Goodwin means here is that when a new event or when something that we're unfamiliar with happens, we still don't have any way to talk about it except to put it into talk with other things we are familiar with. So how will this affect the food supply? How will my rent go up or down? Will this provide new jobs? Uh, these are how we typically talk about things that go on. Will this happen again in the future? What does this mean in the case of Rodney King if I get pulled over? Things like that. What he's doing is saying there's a lot of things that happen that are not considered events at all. And the way that we designate between what is an event and what is not is simply these three things. Now, with coding schemes, Goodwin sort of jumps back a couple weeks in our discussion as a class and hits on this idea that in using an artifact or a thing that is made by humans, whether that's a language set or a theory or a book, or in this case, Munsell's soil color chart, we are reinscribing some pre-existing norm and it's unavoidable. And he takes Munsell's soil chart, which would seem to be maybe the most uh, objective item you could think of, and he describes how even this, which is uh, simply a way for archaeologists to hold soil samples beneath and to compare the color to get an idea of what is going on, how even this is a reaffirmation of a cultural norm. And in this case, he's focusing on the culture of archaeology and uh, actually of 
academia writ large and focusing on the fact that you can't use this without sort of taking for granted some cultural and field norms. You have to know how to read the graph and the chart on the sides. You have to understand uh, that your eyes will be required to translate the glossy paint that is on the chart to the dirt that is underneath that is not glossy. And so actually the colors are never going to match, but you have to figure out a way to line this up. You also have to understand order of operations, meaning you have to know first you pull the chart out, then you uh, get the, the dirt wet and, and turn it into a paste, and then you hold it underneath and compare it. Um, it also requires those that use it to label large sections of dirt by very small samples. So these are the sorts of things that Goodwin is saying about talking about things in general. And he's going to apply these ideas to the Rodney King case, but I believe he's deliberately using faraway examples like the Munsell soil chart to sort of show that these things are everywhere. You can find examples of this throughout, no matter what we're talking about. You can think of the classroom space as another good example of how when you come into this space, it doesn't matter what class you are in, there are a lot of cultural norms that sort of predominate the environment. And we all behave in a certain way and we take for granted that you may want to raise your hand before you speak and that you're going to sit at a desk if you're a student. You should defer to authority of the teacher, things like that. These are all reaffirmations, just like Munsell's soil chart. All right, coding schemes, another term that's deployed and used by Goodwin to describe this idea of using familiar language because it helps you convince people. And, it's, and I've added a couple of colloquial phrases down at the bottom, but specifically the final one, steps one, steps two, and step three, how, how uh, almost all of the instructions we would get with a piece of furniture or uh, something that we have to put together would come labeled like this. And we sort of take for granted that these are verbal codes textualized and sent out to us to sort of make the process seem more familiar and easier. And we're already very familiar with them, so by and large, we don't even notice. But when people deploy these things, am I right? You're not really asking. You're sort of trying to weave some common ground between you and the person you're talking to. And this is what coding schemes are good for. All right, highlighting. And this is, uh, you're welcome to go back and read this long, this long slide at some point. I realize there's a lot of text on here, but long and short, highlighting has to do with pointing to which parts of the story are important. And it, it's, uh, in Goodwin's case, it's incredibly vital to recognize that the things that we don't recognize as important and therefore don't talk about do in fact become invisible quite often. And you can think of the LGBTQ movement in the United States and how throughout the last 20 to 30 years, it has actually picked up an incredible amount of steam and we have made huge progresses in the United States. There's tons of work left to be done. There's been just massive work done in the last quarter of a century. By and large, that has to do with this uh, process of highlighting. It used to be incredibly normal to minimize queer experience in America or in the United States and to act like it didn't exist, to raise children if you were in a heterotypical family to think that queer identities were something they were simply not going to encounter. And in so doing, we forced people, uh, as the phrase goes, into the closet. Straight folks did, heterotypical culture did. And that's why the LGBTQ movement, in part, had such a hard time progressing in the way that it has in the, the last 25 years, is that the visibility that has begun to come caused a bit of a tipping point.